another FAA uh, speaker that uh, flew in from Kansas here yesterday or today, Mark? Uh, Orlando. Well, that's right. You've been all over the country. So, um, anyway, um, it gives me a uh, pleasure to introduce Marv. Marv is the, as the FAA Small Airplane Certification Directorate's Program Manager for Continued Operational Safety. He's involved in a variety of continued airworthiness issues for all sizes and classes of aircraft. His primary focus is age-related regulation, policy, process, and research. Marv's worked for the FAA since 1991. He worked with the Aging Aircraft Program and continued their awareness issues, then spent five years in management before returning to engineering. I'll have to ask about that before I have that. I got my, my ideas. Marv has been intimately involved in recent uh, small airplane age-related safety issues, including the T-34 and T-6 wing failures, the twin Cessna wings fire ADs, eggplane wing fatigue problems, and most recently the Mallard seaplane wing failure, which we've all seen in the news and read about and saw the video. Um, prior to the FAA, Marv worked in industry for 18 years. He worked fatigue problems at Bell Helicopter, then since spent 14 years at McDonald Aircraft Company involved in fatigue analysis and testing for several military fighter programs. While at McDonald Aircraft Company, he also spent a year in Spain consulting the Spanish and damage tolerance evaluation. Marv has a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Kansas. And with that, we'll turn it over to Marv. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, some people, the, the people in Orlando, yesterday I was in Orlando uh, giving a similar presentation to the uh, National Warbird Operators Conference, and there were a lot of people there questioning my sanity of leaving Florida to come to Stevens Point today. So uh, you guys won't question my sanity because you know this is, this is a nice place to be in February. So anyway, uh, thanks Tom for having me, uh, enabling me to speak for a few minutes today on aging airplanes. Before we get going here, well let me figure out see how I'm going to do this operation. I'm used to talking with my hands, so this is going to kind of help that here. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the physics of aging, and that's not going to get too technical, but I hopefully it will set the stage for uh, the next two bullets there, proactive aging management and maintaining aging aircraft. And I'm going to tie in some of the things that we saw relative to the thrush and, and air tractor issues, the ag plane issues, uh, T6, T34, and the 402. So I'm not going to get into those AD specifically in depth uh, like Mark did for the engine the engine ADs, but uh, if we've got time at the end, I would certainly entertain questions on uh, some of the, the more detailed aspects of that. And before we get going, we, I recognize the audience I'm talking to, and you guys are the first line of defense for how we uh, look at aging airplanes. With that, with that said, I've got forms here, a form here, I, uh, we'll get these passed out to you guys, you can kind of take a look at uh, when you get bored listening to me talk. And then later on in the presentation, I will uh, talk a little bit more about that, about what I'm looking, looking for you guys to do. Uh, I made up this form. I'm only an engineer. I made up this form, and we handed it to a mechanic in our office, and he took it over to another mechanic, and he said, oh, mechanics like to circle things, and they like to put check boxes there. So this became a real form for you guys. Otherwise, it'd just be five... You know, five little blank lines say, what about this, what about that, what about this, what about that. So uh, if I can have somebody kind of come down and just kind of pass these out along the row uh, while, and while I keep talking. And, and uh, like I said, I'll get to this form a little bit later. This isn't a test or anything like that. <laughs> okay. A little bit about the physics of aging. Maybe you've seen that video, that's from the, uh, the one out in California in 2002. You've got tension-loaded aircraft structure, that's the bottom of the wing, sitting up there flexing. Bad things are going to happen. And the, the video on the right, of course, is the one from uh, the, the, the accident down in Florida just uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. Uh, when you start getting fatigue cracking, 
you start, you reduce the inherent strength of capability of that wing. So that's why when that guy was coming in to make his, his run to drop that, uh, that fire retardant, he was pulling some Gs, there wasn't enough Gs to sustain the wing and that's why it broke. Same way with that, uh, with that mallard. As the airplane gets older, the probability that this fatigue cracking is gonna happen increases. It just increases steadily with time. <clears throat> I like to look at fatigue uh, to use this analogy of the trust fund. And the way I like to look at this to help, to help understand what it means is each aircraft starts with its own balance in the trust fund. And I don't mean each aircraft model like a Bonanza or a 172 or a, or a Cherokee. I mean each individual airplane has a little bit different balance. You can kind of look at this uh, in a human way is that our life expect expectancies as individuals is all different. We're all not going to live 76.2 years or whatever the average is. We're going to, you know, some people are going to die younger than others and older than others. And that is all, that's just, just the way it is. Well, that's kind of the way it is with airplanes. We can have airplanes that will crack sooner than others for no other reason than it just had different genes, if you will. So each airplane starts with its own balance. Each aircraft withdraws money, if you want to look at it, from its balance differently. So if I fly my airplane to and from church, that may be a dollar an hour to do that. If I'm out turning and burning, that may be two dollars or three dollars for every hour. If I keep my airplane in the hangar and take it and maintain it really well, that may be a dollar every year. If I keep my airplane outside in the coastal Florida where we've got corrosive environment, that might be $5 a year. So every airplane withdraws differently, okay? You can't make deposits. So if I'm out there doing loop-de-loops, the first hour that airplane is brand new off the factory, that fatigue damage is just as severe as damage that's done yesterday to a 40-year-old airplane. So there's no discount for here's what I did when it was new versus here's what I'm doing when it's old. From a fatigue cracking standpoint, a dollar's a dollar's a dollar no matter when you made it. And you can't fix it. Once you take that, once you've made that little bitty fatigue damage to those molecules, you can't repair it. It doesn't repair itself. Okay? Now if we as engineers think we're pretty smart and we can approximate an initial balance of what we think is in this is a pattern. And we can do some analysis without testing and go in there and know the loads and, and do all kinds of fancy stuff like that. And when we're done with that analysis that says we calculate a 100,000 hour life on this particular wing, because we're so good at that, we divide that number by eight to come up with a life that we're comfortable with from a safety standpoint. So we're taking a factor of eight off of that to cover for errors in our analysis variability and all those sorts of things. That's how good we are. If we want to be even better, we can do some fatigue testing where we'll actually cycle that airplane, uh, simulate what it would see in its real life, and if we've done that, then we'll take a scatter factor of five for the FAA. Back in uh, my introduction, he mentioned I worked at McDonnell Aircraft, and back in 1980, I believe it was, I was involved in the full-scale fatigue test of the F-18. And there were a lot of people working on that project, coming up, designing that to make sure it had a 6,000 hour fatigue life, which was a Navy requirement. A lot of people a whole lot smarter and a whole lot more experienced than me. We had a full scale fatigue test. We had, this was back 25 years ago, 110 actuators and we loaded it up with 30,000 cycles of simulated 300 hours of fatigue life. We cranked up that test and we cycled and we cycled and we cycled. And after about a week, it broke at 300 and some odd hours. We had a major wing failure, wing carry through failure. So even the best people can miss fatigue by that far. It's not an exact science, but we can we can approximate that balance. We can also inspect to look for cracks. Okay, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But when we do that, that's kind of like calling up the banker and saying, "How much money is in my trust fund?" And the banker's saying, well, you've got enough to last you another 100 hours. Whatever your inspection interval might be, that's kind of what you're doing. Every time you do an inspection, you should be good to that next inspection. That's based on crack growth and things like that that I won't get into a lot of details. 
So that's what the value of, of inspection steps, okay? And obviously you don't want to overdraw. Yesterday I made a comment to the Warbird guys, I said now, you know, a real glitch in this would be if you didn't know how much your wife was withdrawing. And I got a couple of boos from the females in the crowd, so I said, well, I won't, won't, go, won't go there. Because if you're overdrawn, then you end up with a smoking hole. So think of that analogy. I'm going to come back to that a little bit. Not a lot on the screen. Not too bad. Okay. Okay. Here's another slide that I want to talk about a little bit, because I think this was, is important as well. I told you about my analysis. If I think I've calculated an analysis that says I've got a life of, uh, let's say, five, 10,000 hours. If I'm off over here by my loads or something, I've made, uh, an, not an error necessarily, but just haven't estimated things right, that can cut my life. A 10% change in mis misestimation of my loads or my stresses, for instance, can cut my fatigue life in half. That's how sensitive fatigue is to any change in loads or stresses. And to give you an example of what a 10% change is, if I have this fillet radius that should be a tenth of an inch that's really 07, that changes the stress concentration in that area right there by 10%. So that cuts my fatigue life in half. That's how sensitive it is, okay, just as, as an example. So that's why if you've got a poorly drilled hole, things like that, that can cut your fatigue life drastically. That's, as I said, that's how sensitive it is. Okay? An example of that, and I think that's what my next slide is. Yeah. <clears throat> this is the, uh, the T6 accident that happened down in Florida back in May. Uh, this obviously isn't the uh, crashed airplane. But the problem with that, I don't know, are you, if you're familiar with the, how the T6 wing goes together, it goes like the DC-3. It's got these sets of angles that clamp the center wing to the outer wing. And that's what this is. We're looking at the underside of the wing, up at the underside of the wing. And it's attached with the, I think there's like 123 of these bolts that go all the way around, uh, around the airfoil. But it cracked on the lower surface right in there where these uh, two attached are bolted together. So there's a cross section of what those uh, attach, attach angles look like. These are aluminum angles here. And then I made this little sketch to show uh, where the problem was. This was a detail of a very well-built airplane. This is no doubt that this airplane was built very, very strong from a static strength standpoint, but it had a lousy fatigue detail. Because of the draft angle on that extrusion, they went in there and they put a, a spot face so they would have a nice flat spot for that first row of fasteners right there, or, or right there, both, you know, their spot faces on both sides. So what you've done now is you've got a normal stress concentration just because you're pulling here with your normal tension loads in the wing and you're pushing there because the load's got to go from this angle through those bolts into that angle. So you're, you're trying to pull that angle apart, flatten it out if you will, and that causes a stress concentration around there, which isn't too bad, but then you go put a spot face in there. And I think the drawing the, from the 1940s or whatever called out for this to be a minimum of 01 radius on that spot face. So they're saying that, you know, that you're leaving a sharp corner there. So you put a stress concentration on top of a stress concentration and 60 years of flying, 55 years of flying, whatever it is, and you develop a fatigue crack right in there. And so that's a situation where even though the stresses in this part are pretty low, they're really high right around there because of those stress concentrations. An example of how sensitive fatigue is. So that's why, for those of you that aren't aware, the, uh, the AD requirement is to go do penetrant inspections and there are, there are alternate means of compliance, you can do an eddy current in there, to go look for cracks uh, along the radius. So that's why if you look at the T6 now, you'll see the paint stripped off of this area as they, uh, as they inspect this area for cracks. Haven't found any. So that was an airplane that, uh, in, from a T6 standpoint, that airplane had bad genes. <laughs> 